All right, our presenter today is Dr. Faith Oy. Uh, she is an Extension Associate Professor in Urban Entomology. She specializes in urban entomology. She works with commercial and residential audiences, and she tackles tough problems with ants, termites, um, and the bottom photo there uh, is a bed bug from a bed bug video that she's done. So that's another tough problem as well. And one of her uh, signature programs is Pest Management University. And she's a, a national or if not world uh, authority on urban um, entomology. And we're so lucky to have her here in Florida. And uh, Faith, we welcome you today and are really ready to learn about ants. And I know that there's gonna be some awesome information. And then she even has an ant fighting video coming up. So it's sort of like a little boxing match that's going to happen. Right. So I'm going to stop share and I we welcome you to the Master Gardener webinar. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for having me. So here's kind of what I want to do here. Um, I have a bunch of content. Okay, there we go. I have a bunch of content that is going to be um, lead us up to a lot of control because um, I think that as master gardeners, you're probably going to have a lot of questions coming from the general public on how to control fire ants. But if you would also put questions in the chat as I go, I'm going to kind of try and look at it and make sure that I can hit upon it as we're going through this presentation. And if I don't get to your question, um, please feel free to email me again. I always tell our, our um, very important stakeholders and our county faculty that if you don't hear from me in 48 hours, either something happened to the email or I've dropped off the face of the earth. So please feel free to contact me again as well. So um, thank you for taking time to uh, do our little survey here. And um, Wendy, are we gonna do polls? We, we aren't planning on doing polls. Oh, um, okay. Usually, um, since we're a webinar, we would just ask them to drop something in the chat box or plus or minus or anything like that. You know, thumbs up. I think they can do, they can do. Um, okay, fine. Yeah. That's, that's no problem. So um, I want to first start off by saying I am so excited to speak to Master Gardeners because I usually talk to the pest control industry and I never get to talk about extra floral nectaries, okay, with them. So there is a long history and a lot of evidence to um, connect ants with extra floral nectaries. And what I want to do is start pulling together a story for us on how we can look for ants. I mean, you know, fire ants are fairly easy to see in Florida, especially because we have that sandy soil and those mounds pop up pretty easily, especially after our summer rains. But ants, the extra floral nectaries are very good monitoring tools for us when we start talking about integrated pest management. So I have some references here for you. And I see that one of our excellent agents, um, Mark, has also done a blog from the Northwest District on what um, extra floral nectaries are and the relationship with ants. So let's go ahead and use these extra floral nectaries as a monitoring tool for us as we start building our program on how to look for and control these fire ants. The other thing that we can look at, especially because we're dealing with landscape, right, a lot, is there's a, there's a classic mutualism um, example here of ants tending meal, um, mealworms and scales, ants tending aphids, because these aphids, these types of insects produce honeydew. And how many of you guys have heard, I have sugar ants, when clients come into the office, right? I have sugar ants. I put this example here because all ants are sugar ants. <laughs> That's not going to be helpful to us in identification. So almost all of our ants are going to be subject to this kind of classic mutualism. So these ants, including fire ants, are actually protecting these aphids because the aphids are producing a honeydew that has a lot of sugar in it. And the ants come and they suck up all that sugar as part of their nutrition. So um, just to kind of keep that at the back of your mind, and I'm going to tie this back around to baiting, okay? So 
think back in your master gardener training on how we control some of these scales and aphids because the end message here is decreasing this kind of extra food source may actually help us in the long run when we get to that baiting section, all right? So um, I'm gonna talk to you about fire ants a little bit more seriously now because they are medically important. And every year we have a couple of folks who die in, the, in not just in the state of Florida, I'm talking nationally. And um, it's very sad for us in the state of Florida, we're really mindful about protecting our, um, our clients in nursing homes, right? Because we were like one of the highest number of nursing homes in the United States or in Florida. And every once and again, we get some unhappy report like this where fire ants have gotten into a nursing home, somebody who's incapacitated in their beds is being stung. And in rare, rare occasions, it does lead to death as well. We're also the lawsuit capital of the world. Fire ants have been blamed for a bunch of different stuff. So here's one where it was a $5 million lawsuit. Where I'm still not sure what all happened in this story, but there was an accident. Um, one one um, side of the story said that this, this gentleman was burned by battery acid that came out of a malfunctioning truck. Um, the other side made the case that, oh no, those scars on his legs were actually because of fire ants that stung him and caused him to then become incapacitated and not able to work. And they tried to sue the county because the county didn't take care of the fire ants where the accident happened. So there are all kinds of implications for us and managing fire ants and making sure that we make the right diagnosis. Is, it's kind of serious business. So I wanna get this part out of the way too, because when you have um, folks coming in and asking questions or saying, hey, I have this fire ant problem. In fact, I just got off the phone right before I got on this call. Please tell me what to spray to take care of my ants, okay? Especially with fire ants, this is the least effective method. And we hear this all the time, right? Please come and spray my lawn. I want you to, I want to give you the words on why we don't wanna do this. So number one, there can be about a quarter million ants in one of those fire ant mounts, okay? Spraying is only going to kill those ants that are foraging out of the mound at the time. So foraging is kind of dangerous business and only about 20% of the workers are gonna be foraging at any given time. Most of the workers spend their time inside the mound, right? There's a lot of work to be done inside that mound. They're digging galleries, they're taking care of the queen, they're, they're um, helping feed the brood and whatnot. So there's this whole city underground that we're not privy to. So 90% of their time is actually spent inside the mound, not outside the mound. So spraying is not going to be terribly effective. So the research that backs this was actually done in Florida. So one of these guys, Dr. Porter, ended up at the USDA here in Gainesville, and Dr. Schinkel was at FSU. So this is really good information for us in the state of Florida. One of the things that we do to kind of figure out what kind of ant activity we're having is we get slices of Vienna sausage and you can put that out and you can see ants that you never thought were gonna show up come to Vienna sausage. So um, for whatever reason, and I think I have an idea what the reason is, Vienna sausage is really an excellent monitor here. So one of the take homes for us is gonna be that ants are really formidable. I mean, look at this beetle, it's ginormous, right? And it just takes a few of these ants to kind of haul this, haul this beetle off. And I also want us to think about why ants are challenging to control. So as master gardeners, as trained folks, I'm going to give you the scientific explanation. They're social insects and they belong to a special club. Okay. So eusociality is defined by having these three characteristics. One is cooperative brood care. The other is overlapping generations. And the final one is reproductive division of labor. So cooperative brood care, you know, everybody helps take care of the colony. There's overlapping generations, which is a bit self-explanatory. But this bottom one here, reproductive division of labor is what really separates our, our ants and bees and termites from some of these other more solitary insects. And this is what makes baiting 
so important and such an efficient method for us. So this is the, this is the technical explanation for why ants are difficult to control and why we want to do baiting. But when we talk to our homeowners, we can't be always using this kind of language. So I like to use examples with homeowners. So I tell you know, our homeowners, hey, the social insects are like these insects here, right? Termites, ants, bees. The solitary insects like cockroaches and flies, they're not as difficult to control because they don't have that most excellent communication system that is required when you live in a colony. So these ants are a little society that they live in. So I'm gonna jump us into now ants as the, the fire ants a little bit deeper. So we, right, in the state of Florida, we're so awesome. We get three invasive species a month in the state of Florida. We have the highest number of invasive species of any state in the United States coming to Florida. Now, why do, why do people come to Florida? We generally have a pretty nice climate to live in. And that's also what makes our, you know, makes our state so welcoming to these invasives as well. So if you look at the top 100 global invasive species index, there are five ant species on it. And we have a lot of them, including the fire ant. So the fire ant came from South America. This is what we look like in the United States now. Here's Florida, close up, we are covered up, right? So when, Flo when the fire ants first came in, we believe that they came in through the portomobile in like the 1930s. So E.O. Wilson, he remembers seeing these fire ants as a boy when he was out exploring the environment. And it has gradually made its way. And when I was a student, we used to say, oh, it's never going to go above, you know, above a certain latitude here because it's too cold. These fire ants are never going to survive that. Well, guess what? They've adapted. They're really good at adaptation. And now we see them popping up in places where we never thought they were going to be before. We have some introductions here. So it's probably like people coming from south, going north taking a potted plant that's infested or something. But gradually, this area here that, we're, that I'm kind of outlining with my cursor, they're established. And it's an issue. So here's, I put this up as the invasion curve. So ideally for invasive species, what we want to do is prevent them from coming in in the first place. We simply have not been horribly successful at that. Uh, for a number of different reasons. With the fire ants, we're probably here where we're peaked out, where we're using maximum resources. I mean, it, it's gotten to the point where APHIS has said, well, we're not quarantining this stuff anymore because there's not anything we can do about it at this point. So there's still some landscape quarantines in place. There's still treatment for um, root ball uh, plants when we send them. Um, out of the state of Florida, but by and large, um, the fire ants are kind of everywhere in the southeast. It does have impacts on trade. So this science paper came out about, it's, it's, I can't believe it's a decade already, but they actually were able to get a substantial number of um, samples from 73 sites, um, several different countries, and what it turns out is that there are 322 unique genetic types. Three haplotypes are really common in invaded areas and they're in the US. And now we, one of our major exports in the United States are fire ants. So we have become one of them, one of the biggest um, sharers of this invasive species and they can track it genetically and it has had trade impact with Taiwan and China because they're able to connect where the ants have come from, likely come from. So let's see. Um, field diagnostics, all right. This is the easiest way. How many, okay, I wish we were in a room. How many of you have not stepped in a fire ant mound yet in Florida? Right. So I grew up in Hawaii and we used to run around barefoot all the time. I have not been barefoot since I've lived in Florida because of the fire ants. So one of the things that we would like to do 
is um, look at these moms and determine where they're active. So I get this, right? We like to kick that fire ant mom open and we like to watch them scurry around. So, so Faith, Catherine, yeah. Faith out of, yeah, out of one, out of almost 400 people, one person hasn't. And that's Catherine. And I'm afraid it might be bad luck for her to say that it might happen today. <laughs> and uh, Clara says one of her first memories of a child is being uh, stung by an ant in Texas. And Cheryl's oh. grew up in Florida and she hasn't. Okay, so a pretty small percentage. Wow. Okay, well, it's kind of an exciting thing to step in a mound and not know it. Okay, I've done it because I've been out like hunting termites and I'm so focused on looking at the termites. I've lost track of the fire ants around me. So yeah, it's kind of an exciting thing to have happen to you. But what we want to do when we're, we're trying to help our homeowners figure out whether they have a fire ant problem and what to do about it, what we want to do is this. I'm going to shoot over here. And is this showing up okay for you, Wendy? You see yes. these ants? Yeah, I can see out. them. It looks, it looks like it hurts. Okay, so what you want to do is really gently, like usually where we are, and this is right outside the entomology department here, we're right what we do is just pull the little tip of grass here. And what you see is these ants bubbling out. And that's how we know this, ant, this mound is active, okay? But you haven't done it in a way that's going to make these fire ants move their mound. So then you're going to have to go find another location of where they relocated to. The other thing that I want to play this again, the other thing that I want you to notice is when these guys come boiling out of the mound, there are lots of different sizes of ants coming out. And this is a field diagnostic tool that we can use. So the easiest thing is really the mound. And then if you see a bunch of stuff pop boiling out like that, and you have a lot of different sizes of fire ants, you're kind of certain that you're going to be dealing with something that could sting you. And Sanford Porter, way back in the day, put this very nice slide together of all the different sizes of ants that he's found in that mound. And we call that being, you know, um, it's it, it, it's polymorphic, right? These these ants, and that's a key diagnostic. So if you call in to somebody like me, or you call in to your entomologist, call into Wendy and say, "I have a polymorphic ant in a mound." We're gonna have a pretty good idea of what it is. Okay, so. If you're really into this stuff, and I know we have some folks in entom who, who just love entomology, okay? What we're looking for also is this. There are two nodes between the gaster and the thorax here. And that's, I mean, that's just a gorgeous ant to look at here. So even from this blurry photo from the top, I can see that there's enough space between this thorax and this gaster that there's probably gonna be about two nodes in there, okay? So it's either gonna be a zero, a one, or a two node there. And hey, Wendy, I'm gonna ask you to keep looking at this chat for me and we'll stop every once in a while. You just shout out to me, okay? What these, what, what the comments and questions there's, are. There are some good questions, so. Um, I don't know if you want to tackle them now, but some of them are really kind of interesting. Um, do birds and insects eat fire ants? You know, I've, I've heard that they do. So um, especially with the, with the alates, right? The alate is not going to sting. So they can be eaten. Yes. I don't know if they taste very good, though. <laughs> I, I bet they taste kind of spicy. Um, yeah. And um, Cheryl has a totally organic yard. Do other ants control fire ants? To other, yes, and I'm gonna get there, Cheryl. So we're, that's a very, very good question there. Okay. Um, and, um, and then the, the, I know you're gonna get to this also about the grits. So <laughs> should I just wait? Yeah, we'll wait on grits because we have that too. Okay. Um, is, all Isn't right, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you keep going then, Faith. We're doing good. Okay. Oh, and then Come Linda on. says her chickens eat them. And yeah. I've heard that before. I've heard that too. 
So, oh, and then armadillos digging into the holes. Have you heard that? Yeah, I have armadillos in my yard everywhere and the fire ants have been pushed out by the big headed ants. So I, I, I haven't taken note this year of whether that's happening or not. Yeah. And then we had one other person has a question here along the way. Uh, what type of sh sugar is in the honeydew that they're consuming? Is it a fructose or a sucrose or is it a specific kind of sugar that the ants are after? You know what? I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. I don't think it matters. I think it's a glucose or a fructose because baits are made up with both, right? So, okay. all right. So I'm well, going to... I'm Brenda gonna, wants to hear about those big-headed ants, so but let's keep going. Yeah, so I'm going to tie the big-headed ants with the fire ants when we get to the control part. Um, the fire ant ID part, this is what we normally associate. So if somebody tells you I was bitten by a fire ant, sometimes I just want to, mm, because you, they do kind of nip you, but that's just to hold on to you as the business end of them, the stinger is going into you. So kind of like wasps, they have a smooth stinger. So if you don't brush them off, they're going to continue to sting you and they'll sting you in like a, a whirl, a half, a half circle or a three quarter circle because they gripped onto you. And that's how you can tell, oh, yeah, somebody didn't push that fire and off right away. If you're really, really good with photography and you can get that fire ant to smile like this, you'll be able to count three, four teeth on the mandibles. It is not easy to get them to do this for you. But these are the characters that we look for, right? Two, two segment pedestal, four teeth on the mandibles, and that really awesome stinger. It's, it's quite amazing. So the stinger is a modified ovipositor. And so all of these ants in the colony are girls, right? They're workers. Workers are the girls. If you're going to submit a photo for identification to a county office or to one of us or to Lyle Bus, who's our insect ID person, it's really important to get the correct angle. You see how beautiful these photos are, man? Side, top, and front. That's what we want for ants. We took these. I didn't take these. Somebody took these on this really expensive auto montage system. It takes pictures in layers, so everything is all um, in focus. This, the microscope, you can do this. I think, uh, Wendy, do most of our county offices have a microscope in them? I think so, I would, right? I would say uh, most have a microscope and uh, about 50% have an excellent microscope. Okay, so here's the other thing that we can do. Oh, before I get to that part, it's really important to get those characters. So this is an example of one of my guys. He calls me, he goes, you got to bail me out. I'm traveling. My wife's freaking out. And he sends me this picture. And I was like, I can't see what that is. And this is back in the day. My pest control guys always tease me because I'm still working off an of iPhone 7. Okay, this is when I had a 5. <laughs> so I was trying to look at these pictures on the screen and it was all blurry. And I told him, you're just going to have to wait till I get back to the computer. I blew it up. And he was like, hey, these are fire ant queens. And they, what happens is the fire ant queens, they'll swarm, they'll all kind of cluster together, they cooperate. And once the colony starts going, that alpha queen in the colony, she goes, you sisters, I don't need you anymore. She hasn't executed and then she takes over. So this is kind of an interesting shot that he sent me after all, but two messages, right? So there's something to do with the life cycle. But it's also really important that we be able to see the insects pretty clearly if you're asking for an identification. Collecting ants is super easy. We talked about the whole Vienna sausage thing. I oftentimes just get a card, a business card, and flick it into a Ziploc bag and freeze that Ziploc bag. And what you can do now, it's not as pretty. And once you take those ants out, you'll see that they're kind of all crumpled up. But we get these smartphone magnifiers, and because we order them in bulk, it's like five bucks. And so, Wendy, I have Pest Management University on, on these magnifiers, and we got like a thousand of them for five bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and you can get pictures that are good enough to get you the characters that you need in order to do a very good ant identification. Okay, 
So, or, okay, you guys know I'm being sarcastic, right? Or you could stick your hand in the mound. And this is um, classic pustule. And the old time fire ant guys, they'll tell you, oh, if it has a pustule after you've been stung, then that's the red imported fire ant, Solenopsis invicta. And if you don't get a pustule, this our native fire ant, okay? Solenopsis germinata, it doesn't matter. It still hurts. So there's a small percentage of the population that's going to have some kind of anaphylactic result. And very rarely, we're going to have death associated with it. And that's what we see, you know, about once or twice a year nationwide, there's some kind of news report about something very unfortunate happening because of um, lack of fire ant control. So we have some ants that can be mistaken. We have another invasive species that's coming through um, it, it hit, when things hit North Carolina, I start looking a little bit more closely. So North Carolina, South Carolina, check this out. It's beautiful, right? It's a nice, shiny, big ant, but it also stings. It has a painful sting and it is making its way down. So we've had some reports where it's been in Florida. So just keep your eye out for that Asian needle ant. So just get a picture of that again. So pretty good size ant, about five millimeters. Um, so here's the summary, right? Context for us for ant ID is going to be really important. You want to observe the behavior. Um, is it monomorphic, dimorphic, or polymorphic? Um, give us a description of the mound. And you can always submit, right? You can always submit, but please submit more than one ant. If you just give me one ant, it's really hard to do that ID. So sound is sporadic. Uh oh. Are you hearing me okay, Wendy? Yeah, okay. Um, what is the common denominator in these pictures here? What do you see? Anybody? Soil, mounds? sand. I'm getting it. Pavement, somebody said. Pavement. Okay. Pavement and mounds. Okay, who said pavement? Because you're exactly correct. Uh, Kathy did. All right. Kathy and so, Tina said pavement or concrete. So the pavement edge. So these pavement edges work as really good monitors for us. And there's a reason why these fire ants tend to congregate at those pavement edges, especially in the springtime. It's a heat sink. So these fire ants are cold body, right? They're, they're cold blooded cold blooded animals. And they're gonna have to find some way to keep that queen warm so she can continue to produce those eggs. And these actually turn out to be really excellent places where they can maintain that thermal regulation that they would, you know, or have some kind of degree of thermal regulation is against these um, sidewalks. So we can use these as monitors for activity in larger um, areas of turf. What we don't want to see is these at parent pickup at our schools. And that's why it's really important to, for us to check these things out, right? And in the state of Florida, because we have that sandy soil, look at this. It would be so easy just to step on that because if you're in Alabama or you're Georgia, then you can have the clay soil. You're going to have a little bit more of a mound. But because we're in this sandy soil, it's very easy to miss these kinds of mounds. So I want to talk to you a little bit about mound construction because this is going to be this is going to go to how we do our controls and why some controls are more effective than others. So again, key character for ID is going to be this mound. If you do a cross section of the mound, all this stuff here, these are the galleries that the fire ants have created. So they're very busy in there because they have to maintain these galleries. And every time we have a thunderstorm, right, which is every day in Florida in summer, they have to rebuild these galleries. So our fire ants can actually create galleries that go to our water table, when it, especially when it's dry. They move the queen up and down this mound. It's a thermal regulatory unit. So all this soil that you see on the top has been stuff that they've excavated out from the bottom here. These are foraging tunnels. So in real life, so Wendy, this is by Lake Alice. <laughs> you can see all this. 
These okay. are fire ant foraging tunnels and they'll pop up every once in a while. And you can see that. And what you wanna do, and these foraging tunnels can extend to about a hundred feet, but when we bait, how many of you guys have seen people put bait on top of the mound? And I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. That's like going to Publix and throwing your groceries on the roof, okay? If you bait, because baiting is like a food type, right? If you want to use Amdrill, right, Susan? So you want to take that and scatter about a quarter cup bait around the mound because these foraging tunnels, the ants are going to pop up and go, hey, there's something really good here. Let me haul that piece of bait back. And that's how they're going to pick up our bait. It's not going to be from the top of the mound. So that all has to do with this mound construction here. The other reason that I'm showing this picture to you is that sometimes you, there may be that occasion where you want to do a soil dredge with an insecticide. And I'll tell you, you know, if you contact ants with any insecticide, they're kind of wimpy, they'll die. You want to do it when the queen is up top. So in the summer, if you go out like right now and it's 90 degrees, you're gonna to have to be pouring a lot of insecticide to get the queen because they put her down in the soil to where the soil temperature is probably about 75 degrees. It's comfortable for her down there. If you go in the morning, in the summertime, they'll probably have her further up to the top because she's trying to get, they're trying to get her warmed up again, okay? If you're trying to do a mound drench like in early spring or winter, you're gonna wait till the sun is hitting that side of the mound so it warms up. So this is a lot of temperature, understanding temperature and when to do these treatments. So I used to do master gardener training a long time ago and I learned from somebody who always used to say the timing of your treatment as is, is as important as what you put out. So this is an example of the timing of your treatment being as important as what you put out. Okay, so we talked about this before, right? Spraying is not going to be helpful to us because, you know, most of the foragers are not going to be out there. Let's not confuse our um, fire ants, the tunnels, with big-headed ants. So big-headed ant is another one of those invasive species that's on the list. And we're so lucky in Florida. We have more than one species of big-headed ant. But... Most of us are going to be dealing, well, yeah, I think so. Most of us are going to be dealing with Phydoli megacephala. So these tunnels maybe could be mistaken for this, right? They kind of look the same. I mean, even, you know, I will go and I will poke my finger in that and then I will go, oh, you know what? I'm seeing this kind of ant where I have a major ant and a minor ant. So this is not gonna be our fire ant. And oh, I didn't get stung when I stuck my finger in that, that either. So I know that, that this is gonna be our big headed ant. This, what you see here is what we call trophallaxis. It's a sharing of resources, right? So this is how the, the ants are gonna be sharing food. They're gonna be sharing chemical communication signals. They can be sharing the bait toxicant that you put out. So instead of you trying to find every single ant to kill in that colony that has a quarter million individuals, we're exploiting the ant behavior by using a bait. So I'm gonna start talking to you a little bit about how baits work, but I wanna do, um, I'm gonna put this up here. So how many ways can we kill fire ants? I've heard this, okay, fire. Yes, fire will take care of a lot of things. We don't want any uncontrolled fires. And it's probably not going to get the queen. Not helpful. Um, hot water, boiling water. Um, my husband's, uh, one of our friends tried to do this because they wanted something natural and he got a really nasty burn. So their risk to, fight, you know, using boiling water, but it also will kill your grass. So what we really like is bait. And so what you see here is an ant hauling off a bait particle. The way that our baits work, especially fire ant baits, I'm talking about fire ant baits in particular now, is the toxicant is mixed in a soybean oil. 
and the soybean oil is put onto an extruded corn grit. And when the ants pick that bait particle up, they're taking it back to the colony. Are they gonna eat it? They're sucking the oil out, okay? So I know that corn grit kind of looks, that extruded corn grit looks like the grits that you can get from Publix, okay? But it doesn't work. The, the, our, our ants don't eat solid food. So what happens is they're taking this grit back, this extruded corn grit that has our toxicant on it, back to the colony, and they're sucking out the soybean oil, sharing it with the colony, they may also be putting that corn grit particle onto the third instar larvae that has the equivalent of an external stomach. And that mature larvae has an external stomach with digestive enzymes that start to break down our, the solid food particles. Adult comes back, sucks up that liquefied product, and then they go back and they share it. So it's a kind of cool system and you may as well exploit the ants, you know, the ants behavior in order to um, help you get control. So I talk about this a lot with pest control folks and it's too much for homeowners, okay? But this is just to show you that, you know, you have chemicals and you have choices and they have a lot of chemicals too. And they're really good about getting around some of the things that we do. I did wanna point out this here to you about the um, trail following pheromone and alarm recruitment pheromone. So if you step in a mound and you smash those ants on you, the alarm pheromone that comes off of these females says, hey, sisters, I'm in trouble, come and help me. So, you know, you can brush those ants off, but you should be moving out of the area too, because you don't want more ants to be coming up on you. Don't stand still where you're at. Um, I love this one. Their ants are just like way cool. I mean, I could do a whole semester class on this, but get this, we know at least um, in some ants that trail following pheromone actually provides like a memory component to where food is. So sanitation is really important for us when we're talking to homeowners about integrated pest management. And yes, um, the, the fire ants can come into our house. So Wendy knows we have a training facility down at Apopka where we take pest control folks. The, we had fire ants move in to the house because we didn't have, it, it, we didn't build it real tight, right? So yes, fire ants can come indoors and we wanna use integrated pest management. So we wanna stop our pest. We wanna inspect and monitor for pests. We wanna identify those pests and then have a game plan. And so we're gonna talk about the game plan part now, but it's also important to go back and evaluate. So IPM is this process here, is this process and here are our tactics. Um, and I'm sure that you've heard the whole IPM talk many, many times. It's not just one thing. And it's also been called common sense pest control. And part of it is gonna be that sanitation part. So that phone call that I was on right before I came on this meeting, that, that, um, that guy that I was talking to, he's like, oh, I need to take out my trash. I can see them trailing in right now. It's like, yes, you need to do that and, and wipe the trails down. So pros and cons of individual mound treatment. So back in the day, and I've been at this for a really long time, there was this really stinky chemical called Orthy. I don't know if Wendy's going, yeah, <laughs> this is an orthene treatment. Oh my gosh. All we've done is put this stinky old treatment on top of the mound and given a signal to all the ants inside that something really bad has happened to their house. They should move. And that's what happens. Okay. If you're going to do this kind of dust treatment, there's a way to do it. This is not the way to do it. The issue with treating mounds individually is you got to find them, you got to be able to, you know, access. I mean, this stuff here, if you're doing like a field trial, hauling out insecticide in water is a really tough thing. What we want to do is bait. We want to bait on a good day to have a picnic. Okay, so that's going to be between 70 and 90 degrees. And you can decrease that colony by a lot. 
okay, by by doing baiting. You want to do it not um, well within not within 24 hours of a rain. And the reason is those ants are going to need about two hours to pick up those granules and transmit it through the colony. So if you have irrigation going off when you're trying to bait, that can always be an issue. So you want to be able to coordinate that irrigation um, schedule with, uh, with your controls as well. So bait on a good day to have a picnic and don't bait within 24 hours of, of some kind of rain event. The bottom of the screens are cut off. Hmm. Sorry about that. Is, are you seeing it okay, Wendy? Yes, I'm seeing it okay. It's, I think it's uh, how their view is. Okay. So this is, this is my walk up to the entomology department. We water our walls, okay? That's not a good thing to have. They really cut back a lot of this here. But, you know, if you have irrigation, you might also want to have, you know, allow some drying time before you do a broadcast feed is the point of this. Um, calibrating equipment is kind of important. We know that most people are putting out three to five times more than they need. And then after a couple of days, you want to go back and do some kind of, you know, check it. Pull that grass, see if the ants are still bubbling out like what we saw in the beginning in that video. That's not what you want to do for fire ant treatment. I see this all the time. This is on an IFAS property, okay? This is not going to be really helpful. Again, you want to bait around the mound about one to three feet out. That's how we want to do our baits there. I am going to let you screenshot this stuff if you want to, but this point is... All ants eat sugar, okay? These ants here are red imported fire ant and are southern fire ant. They're kind of like the pigs of the ant world. They eat everything going across. Our big headed ants eat fire ant bait. So if you have a big headed ant problem, you could also put on a fire ant bait and take care of those big headed ants that other invasive species. So here's my, here's my list, Wendy. I haven't done my recommendations yet, but here it is, <laughs> my best slide recommendations. These are our baits. You need to be really careful about where you wanna put it out, if it's gonna be urban. And I'll, I'll send this talk to you, Wendy, you can have it. Um, the non, you know, urban non-crop versus agriculture. And then I have a little comment here about how long it's gonna take for these baits to work. Now, I left this this way because our baits are changing all the time. You may be able to find these on the market, but the manufacturers are no longer supporting it. So there's, there's always a little bit of time where you're gonna find products that are out there, but they're no longer on the manufacturer's website. Just make sure you follow the label, okay? Um, this is a really good question from Brenda. Is bait toxic to pets? I wouldn't let my pets eat it on purpose, but it has much less active ingredient in it than any other control product out there. And if you look at the um, labels, uh, I don't want to say it's it's not toxic, but it's it's really not something that we're um, we usually run into. So about 20 years ago, they did a calculation, the USDA folks did a calculation that if you bait, it's about a 90, 99% reduction of active ingredient into the environment compared to actually doing like a drench or putting out other insecticides. So that's a little bit of a roundabout way to answer that question, Brenda. Um, my dog will try to eat the bait. How long after baiting might be it safe? Um, see, oh, for, again, you know, I'm going to refer you back to the pesticide label for instructions. And I would um, look at any directions that talk about re-entry interval, okay? Because it's going to vary depending on product. Uh, how do these chemicals affect other insects? Not much, except Cheryl, like I said, the fire ant baits will actually 
also control the big headed ants. One of the reasons that the fire ant baits um, have been very, have been favored by a lot of conservation groups is again, it goes back to these fire ants kind of being the pigs of the ant world. And they had put the active ingredient at a concentration that was a little higher than any other ant would touch. Only the fire ants would pick up that bait. So there's some, there's a little bit of science behind that. Storing the bait is important too. Joe, you're, you just were reading my mind, okay? So if you open a bait container and you leave it sitting in the Florida sun for a month, it's gonna be like rancid potato chips because it's oil. And apparently the, the, the ants are much more discriminating than some of the graduate students that we've had around here because we used to have a bag of rancid potato chips in our kit just so people could smell what rancid oil smelled like. And I don't have any anymore because a long time ago they ate those chips and I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? So yes, storing the bait is really important. All right. So um, ants are omnivores. They're going to diet switch. Just know what they're feeding on, you know, during, during that, um, that particular season. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, this nutrient partitioning. So again, just going back to this trophallaxis being really important for us to uh, effectively distribute um, baits through the system here. Okay, this is what I wanted to get to, fire ant grits. We have a lot of our homeowners who go, I'm going to get grits because it's organic, right? It's in, you can get it at Publix for like $1.99 or something. I'm going to sprinkle it on the mound. And you guys know the rest of the story. The ants are going to drink the fire, um, drink water after they've eaten the grits. And the grits are going to expand and the fire ants will explode. It's a very compelling story. I kind of like it myself, except it doesn't work that way. So... Here's a, crop, here's a side view of ants and the, the crop where all the liquid is stored here. Check this out, aren't they pretty? So you can tell when they're feeding on something because they're pretty transparent. And you can see that, you know, this sugar water here is quite appealing to these ghost ants, kind of works that way with our fire ants. But this is the reason that fire ants and other ants don't eat solids. Okay, so this is, I don't know how this kid did it, but this is a cross section of an ant head. And he was actually able to cut the pharynx and esophagus of the ant in half so that we could see it. And if you go further down, you see all these hairs here, the cilia. All these cilia catch particles that are as small as a virus. And that's why they don't eat solid food, okay? So, Wendy, can I have two more minutes to finish up? Are we doing okay? You're doing great. And um, I think we're probably gonna go over if you'll be patient enough to handle these questions. So yes, please, sure. please rock on. And some people have asked to see some slides over again. So we'll have to do that too. Okay, no problem. So, some of you may have heard about the biocontrol efforts, right, that are going on. I love this story. It's awesome. So how many of you guys have heard about this forward fly? It's just like aliens, man. <laughs> I love that movie too. So here is the ant. It's literally lost its head because these forward flies will actually, let me go back here. We have several species now where that fly is about that size and it puts its ovipositor between the intersegmental membrane of the head and the body or by, with the thorax and the body, okay? And a fly egg turns into what? A maggot, right? So the maggot is eating this, this inside of the firefly and it uses its head as a puparium. So when the fly is ready to emerge, the fire ant head falls off. And that's one way, it's, it's a visual, people get all freaked out about it sometimes or they think it's really cool. Um, 
you might get this question from homeowners. Um, can these flies attack me? And the question, the answer is no. It's very specific, not just to ants, but to fire ants. So the USDA had to go through a lot of testing to make sure it wasn't going to decimate our native ant species. But here's the here's what it looks like, right? So when the fight when the horde flies are flying about. It not just kills them directly, but it halts their foraging because the ants know that something is going to be there. Something not good is going to be there. So this is my husband, right? He's looking straight at me. He goes, told you, stress kills. Okay, so, so this is what happens with, with our fire ants here and the forward fly. We also have um, uh, Neilhazia. It's, it's a fungus now. They've, they've changed this thing around several times. And they've been able to track it in populations across the Southeast. And what it does is this uh, pathogen actually squeezes out, it's, it lives in the fat body and in the queen, you know, actually squeeze out her ovaries, okay? So in time, this is an early infection and in about nine months, check that out. It's, I mean, she's basically, it's basically shut down her egg production. So. Between these biocontrols and the baits that we have, we've been actually able to effectively take care of fire ants. It is unrealistic to think we're going to be rid of fire ants in the, in the state of Florida, but we can definitely maintain certain places so that the risk of fire ants is going to be much less. Okay, so the catch with biocontrol is if you kill all the imported fire ants, then you biocontrol too, and the most in aggressive species is going to reinvade um, and come into that territory. Nature hates a void. So the other invasive species, depending on what part you are in Florida, is going to be that tawny crazy ant that we have to look at. Um, people are praying for the fire ants to come back when they're in an area with tawny crazy ant. How did we get these ants? A lot of it is attached to landscape. We move landscape around and we keep reinfesting ourselves. So integrated pest management, non-chemical sanitation is going to be key. We want to make sure that we can have our doors and our windows as tight as possible. Wiping down trails, there's something to be said for that because of the pheromones that are available. And then we want to use our um, you know, insecticides judiciously. So I'm going to stop there, Wendy. And you know we can we can do questions if you want. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's that's wonderful. Wow, we got so much great knowledge and amazing photos. Everyone is is loving it. Um, so um, while we're answering questions, someone asked that you put put the first bait slide back up. Um, the let me see which one was that. Yep. Okay. This one. Yes, that one. Okay. <laughs> that one. Um, so a question that we have is um, what to use in the vegetable garden for the imported fire ant or, or ants that are uh, a problem in the vegetable garden. So here's what I recommend. I don't like putting anything in my vegetable garden, but because these ants can forage 100 feet away, right, from where the colony is, you can put it in the path to the garden and they'll pick it up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And that's kind of, that's sort of our master gardener recommendation. Um, the other recommendation too, is that if you find out that someone has used Andro or a strong bait in the vegetable garden that remind them that, that that's a problem and that that's off label and those veggies probably should not be eaten. Um, so just to let them know that. Um, so Tina McIntyre, who we all know and love uh, down in um, Central Florida has asked, what about the gel baits? So gel baits work well for ants in general. Um, it's just a, it's a matter of how much bait you can put out with a gel bait. So some of the gel baits are more expensive and that's why a lot of these pest control guys or even homeowners, right? You can put out a granular pretty easily. Um, there's a there was a paper that came out this year that talked about how the gel baits the more viscous a fluid was the harder the ants had to work mm -hmm. so they became disincentivized to feed on things that were harder for them to suck up so liquids actually work okay especially this time of year 
but for fire ants, man, those those andros, the the andro type beets tend to work really well. It's just taken up in that soybean oil, and they love it. And now we have we have our na native ants here that are are doing good things for us too. Will these baits uh, interfere with them? Will it take them out? So if it's a sugar-based bait, I'd be careful. And that's one of the reasons that Amdro is, is um, you know, I like it because you generally won't find our native ants picking that up. Okay. Um, what if you only see exit holes and not the mound? Is that probably not imported fire ant? Mm, that's a tough one because it could also be that Fidoli. Okay. I see that in my yard, Wendy, where it's like, oh, and then I start tracking them and it's Fidoli. It's not our fire ant. Okay. But it sounds like the Vienna sausage would be helpful in this situation. Yes. <laughs> that's new to me. That is so new to me for today. Um, so Eva Anderson wants to know, um, are there any GMO ants as we're thinking about doing GMO with mosquitoes? No, not yet. Um, and, and good question. I think it would be kind of difficult because of the reproductive system that they have, but hey, you know, who knows? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Greg says uh, baits is like extinguish or effective for lawn or field. What would you use for container plants? And we also have another question in the chat that asked about containers or pots. And I'll just briefly say that there were whole nurseries in Homestead uh, where I grew up that would put every pot up on a cinder block to, so that connection wouldn't be there to the ground. But so that's, a, that's kind of an IPM cultural method, but what do you recommend for containers? You could use the same bait, just make sure that it's you know within the label guidance, but it's just a matter of, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to go through the, the label directions in my head. I would read the label for whatever bait you pick. Yeah, but I don't think it would be an off-label application to do put some bait into a pot. Right. And, you know, and I've had to flood pots before, just yeah. flood, 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 you know, because I didn't want to use chemical on that, probably because it was an edible. And then I made sure that I kept it up after the flooding, put, up, put it on a brick so I can't make the connection to the soil. What do you think about that, Dr. Wayne? Uh, that is a recommendation that we make for, um, especially in the winter time, right? For insects in general, you wanna flood those pots to try and force out any kind of arthropod life before you bring it into the house. That's a really good idea, Wendy. Okay. Um, what about diatomaceous earth and ants? Um, I don't think you're gonna get the kind of lasting control that you would like with diatomaceous earth, you'll get probably some individual kill and, but not a lot. Okay. Um, and then for the forward flies, how long does it take to do the job to pop that head off? How long a process is that? Oh, I'm gonna have to look that specifically up for you, but I wanna say that it was like under two weeks. Oh, okay. It's fast. Okay. Um, yeah. and so Julie wants to know, what does it mean to wipe down the trails? Are we using our COVID Clorox wipes or what are we using to wipe down those trails? You could use anything, Fantastic, Windex. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot. Yeah, okay. the, the wipes would work. All right, most folks have talked about the diatomaceous earth and you've addressed that. So probably not, right? Yeah. Um, and um, I think the ants have created their nest below a slab of my house. So not really a mound. What, what do we do about those foundation um, ants? The, the best recommendation is to try and bait them out. Bait, use a bait to bait them out okay. so that, yeah, they're working for you. Okay. And then that, um, that I guess you said it's a new fungicide, uh, not fungicide, but a, um, a parasite The um, is the... Oh, I can't remember the name, but the K solanapsi available for homeowner use. Oh, uh, the Neil Hazy. You know, I don't think it is available. Okay. So, yeah. But okay. it's out there. It's being spread naturally. All right. Um, Vicki wants to know how does the Vienna sausage work? Um, she's, she needs to go to on a picnic with me, but I'll let you go ahead and explain that. <laughs> You know, for the Vienna sausage, I used to think of it as a protein. I don't know, maybe it's because I'm from Hawaii or something. But if you look at the can, 
it's like 35% fat in there. Okay. And there's a moisture source, right? Because it's in that broth. For it. So that combination somehow seems to work really well. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. So we actually had a couple of questions about the slab. Um, in a mound, what is the ratio of male to female ants? Do you know? So in the mound, they're all girls. Okay. The males come out at one time of the year. They mate and they die. That's it. Okay. Um, since this group is working on lawn and landscaping regularly at higher and at higher risk for fire ant stings, is there a known effective immunotherapy or something that can be done for the sting toxin? Mm, that's a medical question. I would, especially if you're sensitive, I would ask your doctor about that one. Great. And uh, Diane waters her container plants with soapy water. Is that good at keeping the ants from nesting there? Um, I'm, I would be real cautious with that over the years. Um, I think that could build up and, and be a problem. Uh, somebody wanted to know what's the ideal temperature for the fire ants or for our Florida ants? So I would stick with a good day to have a picnic at 70 to 90 degrees. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and Jennifer, uh, who's our producer today, helped us to say that the Vienna sausage is just to draw them out to identify them to figure out what the ants are. Yes, so thank it's you a for lure. Thank that you. Clarification. <laughs> um, and so, you know, Faith, um, the uh, one of the things, and I'm going to get to Fred's question. He said, Fred's question is, what about granular treatments such as uh, spectracide? And I'm, I wanted to let you know that, you know, when we, when we poll master gardeners and the gardening public, we ask them, well, what kind of pesticides do you use in your landscape? And, you know, there's the, the, the group that is controlling chinch bugs and, you know, all that. But many of our master gardeners say, I don't really use pesticides in my landscape, except for fire ants. And so, and what's so, what's so nice about that is that they can use the baits and that's our IPM spot treatment. Mm -hmm. But Fred was asking about doing a broad treatment with the spectricide or something of that nature. And so talking about that a little bit, what do you think is best, you know, baiting or using a broad treatment? So if you're talking about a broadcast of a contact insecticide, our environment in Florida is harsh enough that that's not gonna last very long. Okay. So the baits are probably the better option for us. And we're looking at baiting two to four times a year as a broadcast bait. Um, these, you don't even have to put out that bait evenly in a broadcast. You can put it out in strips. And because these ants are so good at foraging and picking up the bait, then um, you, know, you, you probably have some good control. And then a week later, go behind and see if they're active mounds. So that's what our recommendation is. Okay, and then um, a really important question because you talked about this timing and maybe we need to say it again. When, when is that best time to do that baiting? So I would start the first baiting probably late spring, okay? Because in early, early spring, the egg production of the queens is not really cranked up yet. So they might not be as interested in picking up a bait, but as we get to like the February, March, and then another three months later, another three months later. So we're kind of looking at that kind of rotation, but again, make sure you read the label on the, whatever product that you're using. Right. Um, and so Babette has little red ants, smaller than fire ants that get into trees and containers. And then someone from Broward County also asked about that ant that's mostly in the trees down there. Um, I don't know if you know about that one. I'm wondering if it's these. Okay. We had the little fire at too. Yeah. And um, so you can use a bait that has a smaller granule and it will be effective against these little fire ants. So something like a Nyvan fine granule, um, a Max Force uh, complete insect granule because it has a range of sizes in there. But again, you know, going back to this, this notion of exploiting the ant behavior is going to be really important. Contact insecticides are not generally very effective for social insects like ants. Okay. Um, gosh, um, so we have a lot of um, uh, uh, home remedies for treating 
fire ant baits, but I'm not going to talk about that officially. So if you all want to look in there, you can. But um, and then Alice wants to know what about black ants? They really aren't a problem, except they come around to get the garbage and come around the house and that sort of thing. So the black you are you talking about like a black crazy ant? I think so, they are. Yeah. So other ants like that black crazy ant, a liquid bait would be really helpful. So you could use a taro or some other liquid bait. And especially this time of year, I keep telling, um, you know, our, our pest control guys, if ants are kind of like us, if it's hot and they're thirsty, that's what they're going to go for. Okay. Okay. Um, and then Dan is, um, has fire ants that get into his orchids and he uses insecticidal soap. So that's kind of a contact, but it doesn't, it's, it's sort of like it's, it's driving them away instead of killing them. I'm not sure. What do you think about that in the orchids? I don't know what it would do to the orchids. <laughs> so, yeah. Wendy, what do you think? Um, I think that's probably more the, the liquid and the drowning and maybe knocking out that trail a little bit. Um, but I do, it's interesting for me, uh, Faith, sometimes I feel like they're coming in for certain things that yeah. the roots are exuding or, you know, um, I think really close scouting helps so much to mm -hmm. start a problem when it's small before it can get any bigger. Right. Um, so just scouting those really quickly. And so, and um, somebody mentioned coffee grounds to work for control. Is that yeah, I've heard that before, but I don't know that it would be very effective. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Rachel says, I've heard that the ants that live in a single volcano shaped mounds actually eat and destroy fire ants. Is that true? Ah, you're talking about pyramid ants. So pyramid ants. So pyramid ants are predators of fire ants. And so we run into folks who say um, on lawn care side, right? I want you to eliminate every single mound on my my um, grass because I don't want to have any blemishes in my grass. But when you do that, you're taking out your biocontrol too. So yes, pyramid ants can be biocontrol for fire ants. Okay, and and the ghost ants um, are when they get in pots with the bait work on the ghost ants. Yeah, and again, that one for ghost ants, I would use this this time of year. I'd go with a liquid. Okay, good. So um, Faith, I think uh, we're getting close to wrapping up here. Are there any um, great uh, publications or Ask IFAS documents that you would recommend for the master gardeners to really rely on? So there is a fire ant document on EDIS okay. that was put together by the fire ant COP for e-extension. That is quite good. Great. And yeah. that is, let me see that, um, let me check that one out. Yeah, and so if you just go to Ask IFAS and type in um, imported fire ants, you're gonna get a lot of great information there. And so that's a good one. And I, I did wanna mention something else, Faith, because the, the time, and Jennifer just put it into the, um, into the chat box, that great document. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the, your findings with the school integrated pest management that were um, that when you really sealed up the windows and the mm -hmm. doors and all the cracks where the insects were coming in that she found um, so much um, energy savings as well. So if you can tighten that house up to keep the insects out, you get another an added benefit. Yes. Do you want to speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. So whatever you're doing for energy, cons um, energy conservation will help you with your pest control. Whatever you're doing for security, it's the same behavior, right? You're monitoring. That will help you for pest control. You need to know what to look for, though. And that's, you know, what, so one of the things of, I, I really love this series that you're doing, Wendy, because it helps with that knowing what to look for part. Right, right, right. Good. Awesome. Well, great. Everyone is loving your presentation um, and they um, are all about the baits. Um, and I did want to let folks know that we will have this recording available. Uh, someone wanted to show it to their HOA. And yes, this recording will be available and you will be able to uh, uh, share that with your friends and neighbors who have always wanted to know more about fire fire ants and what's going on with fire ants in Florida. But as uh, with just a, a big thank you. And we're so grateful, Dr. Oy, for you being with us today. And we really appreciate it.
Um, so thanks so much. And if you have any questions for um, uh, Dr. Roy, you can always email her directly. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.